Hello, it's very really nice to be here. Uh, my presentation will be in English because my Ukrainian is non-existent, so sorry about that. And today, I'll talk to you about how to melt both castles in the sand. Backward management practices. So, why this title? Well, if you both castles, both castles in the sand, they may seem pretty. They're beautiful, they look nice in pictures, you can present them to your friends, whatsoever. But, there's a slight problem with them. They may be easily destroyed. So, that's the same thing with the backlog that you're building. If your backlog is built from the sand, then it's prone to damage. And if it's damaged, then the project has a problem, and you, as a business analyst, has even a bigger problem. Because you then have to fix it all the way. So, what kind of castle do we want to build? We want to build a beautiful castle from a stone. So how do you build a castle that will last ages? How do you build a backlog that will last from the very beginning of a project till the very end and still be relevant? So the first step that you will take, you have to have the right plan. What are the main elements of a right plan when it comes to back? The first thing and the most important thing, which is quite difficult to achieve, is forming the right vision. What is a vision? Vision is a reason of a product being. Vision is something that is a sketch of the future. Every product that you're building, every project that you're building, has to fit in the vision that you have. So, a good example of a vision is a vision not related to IT, but to toys industry. The company, Toys R Us. Do you know it? Yeah. So, Toys R Us is a huge American toys company, and their vision is to bring the smile on parents' faces and to bring joy to children. That's their vision. And every product that they try to sell, every initiative that they have, they try to fit it into this vision that they have. So, what are the qualities of a good vision? It has to be shared and unified. Why it has to be shared? Because it's not possible for one person to form the vision for the whole company. It has to be unified, so all of the members of the team all of the members, all of the stakeholders that are involved in the project need to form a vision. And why is it such a difficult thing? Well, it is quite easy for the companies that have their own internal products, but it is quite difficult for the companies that are working with external clients. So what to do in that case? What you can do is try to get some kind of vision even from the company page, because every company tries to expose their vision. And here we come to the second quality of a vision. It has to be broad and engaging. All of the members of the team that are working on the project need to understand your vision and need to live with it, with each and every project that, that you're making. So, become, going back to Toys R Us, to bring the joy, joy to children. Well, it is broad. And I want to bring the joy to children. I want to see the smiles on the parents' faces. So that's the quality of a good vision. And also, a good vision needs to be short and sweet. So you can't elaborate and put your vision of, of for example, four or five pages or whatever the number of words you want to use. It has to be short. Because someone says that minimalism, minimalism is the most Per, most perfect solution. So that's why you have to be short and sweet. And why do you need your vision? Because the vision then will be used to form all of the goals that you have on the web. And if you do not have a goal, then every road will take you there. And we need to have specific roads that we take into our project. And speaking about the roads, the other thing that you need when you're planning your whole solution is the right map. So there are several numbers of maps that can be used for the project and several numbers of maps that may be used together or individually. It doesn't matter if you use all of them, 
you can use each and every one of them and still it will be good. So the first one is the roadmap. The simplest one. We've all heard about it, all the companies are using it, but the main problem of a roadmap is that sometimes it may be too detailed, sometimes it may contain a lot of additional information that are uh, not needed. For example, on this one. This roadmap is roadmap from Intel. It only describes the model of the processes that they will have. So that's too broad. But there is a thing called theme-based roadmap. So rather than focusing on the milestones, you focus on the themes that you want to deliver and then form them into milestones. So roadmap is the first map. It brings the uh, iterative delivery that you can have so it's, it helps you define the, the stages that you want to release your project and also brings a, brings a whole sketch of the future and the evolvement of the project. The second map that you can use is a, is a story map. Story map focuses more about, of, about the user and the person that will use your solution, so the end customer. You can then describe the journey of a customer end to end and then put all of the requirements under that. Even user stories or you can even put epics and then form them into user stories. That's up to you. And the third one, and the third one is the most difficult one from my perspective and also the most helpful one. So the third one is the impact map. Uh, have any of you heard about impact maps? Okay, so let me just give you a sketch about what impact maps are about. So when it comes to impact maps, we start with a goal. And that's within the center. Then we go with the actors, so the people that can actually help us to realize this goal. Then we define impacts. So when we come to the project-specific world, IT world, think about impacts as some kind of ethics, some kind of features, big features that may be delivered by those actors. And then we have deliverables. But those fourth level elements do not have to be user stories and requirements. They may be even on a higher level, and then you can go further and further and further and further. So why impact map are important? So this is a great tool to get quick wins and quick losses. If you have a goal and you put metrics to all of those impacts that you have, it doesn't matter from which level you take the action. If you take it, you can then measure it and verify whether that's the good way to go. If that's the good way to go, the metrics uh, are working, the KPIs are on the right level, then we go with this, this way. If not, then we omit it completely and go in a different direction. So, as you can see, all of those maps may be used on different stages of the project, so impact map at the very beginning, then roadmap, then user story map, or you can use them individually. So each of those maps may act as a separate solution for your project, just to verify some of the assumptions that you have at the very beginning. Okay, so we have our vision, we have our map, then we need a board. There's a saying in Scrum, let's put it over to the backlog. Each and every member of a team, customer, wants to put everything, wants to put everything into the backlog. And what is the result of it? Messy pile of tasks that we cannot know how to manage and we do not know what to do with it. So to help us with that, uh, there is something called problem board. And the problem board is a thing that helps to manage the customer expectation and also helps to write down all of the problems that the customer has. So first we define problems and goals. So the main problem of a customer that he came to us with, and then the goal, what is, what is the, the purpose, and how to solve you know, on a high level this problem. Then we put the metrics, how to verify it, and then we put the features. So then we'll have a board with all of the different problems that the customer have or may have with goals, metrics, and those goals then may be used to define separate backlogs. So each and every problem with a goal that we have on this board can be then defined as a separate backlog rather than 
putting all into one backlog and then struggling with, with prioritization of it. Okay, so we have our plan in place. Then we have to build our foundation. So the foundation is the set of good practices, how to start putting your task into backlog and how to manage your backlog in general. The first thing that you have to understand is that backlog may have many levels. We may have the opportunities backlog, the photo backlog, and the team backlog. How those set backlogs work? Well, the first backlog is some kind of a wish list center. We try to manage customer expectation, but still we put all of the things to this backlog. Then, with a collaboration with product owner, if you do not have a product owner, then you have to decide which of those items have to go to the photo backlog. So think of a photo backlog as a, some kind of a sketch of an MVP that you want to build. And then, if you have the filter backlog, you can go directly to the team backlog, so the backlog that the team will need. And why those two backlogs are separated? The reason is simple. There may be many team backlogs, or many teams may be working on different elements of a whole project, but you will have one filter backlog with the whole scope. There is also additional backlog called trash backlog. That's where all of the things from the opportunities goes. The statistic says that roughly around 80% of things from opportunities backlog goes to trash. And why we need to keep such a backlog? Um, well, it's quite useful because some things that were not relevant at the very point of defining the photo backlog may be relevant in the future. So that's why, why we need to keep it for archiving, archiving purposes only, to be honest. So, we have our backlog, trim and fitted, and then the backlog needs to be deep. So what does it mean? The deep backlog is a backlog that is detailed enough, so all of the items that we have in the backlog are as detailed as possible at the stage of a project. So you know that when we define the, the elements of the backlog at the very beginning, they are rough sketch of what needs to be done. Then when we work on them, we go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and we are describing all of those elements in much more detail. So then we have to estimate it and we have to keep it emerging because backlog is constantly evolving. It doesn't matter at which stage of the project you are, you always have to keep your backlog in shape, and the backlog needs to always evolve. And then, the last thing, but not least, is you need to have it prioritized. Because backlog without good priorities is nothing. Sadly. Okay. Now we can actually focus on constructing our cast or our backlog. And there are several good rules that we need to use when we are trying to build the elements of our backlog. First, we need to consider all the feedback that we receive from the customer or from the team. Always try to involve the team into managing the backlog. On a grooming session or on our triangle meetings, try to do workshops, try to do demos, try to do as many meetings as you can. Try to make the collaboration uh, around the backlog really working. So you need to gather feedback from the customer or from the team members. Then you need to have your estimates. If you do not have your estimates and you do not have your backlog estimated, then it's really hard to manage the expectation of the customer and the priorities as well. Because then you do not have the direct result, a relation between the amount of work that needs to be consumed and the actual value that it will bring to the project. Keep the sketches of the things that we need to do. So even if you are working on some future elements, you need to have some kind of descriptions uh, as detailed as possible at the very stage of the project because then it will be quite hard to understand what you meant by some two sentences, for example. So always try to keep the sketches understandable and keep your descriptions intact. And then keep layers. So layers in the backlog can work in many directions. It can be epics, it can be features, it can be use cases, but use the layers. Try to build your backlog in a way 
that it will have some kind of hierarchy, just like in medieval times. And now we come to the final touches. So what are the things that may influence our backlog even more? What are the things that may help to create, to make our backlog even better? So the first thing, grow and refine. Always work on your backlog iteratively. Some things may not be relevant anymore, some may be more important, some may need, some may need new details, there may be some new emergent requirements that you need to put on the backlog. That's why you need to refine it and groom it immediately and constantly. Keep it visible. Try to expose it. You can use Vira, you can use Kanban board, you can use Trello, all of the tools that you have at your, uh, at your service. But try to expose it to the team, try to, try to uh, show it to the customer, because if it's visible, then different people can provide feedback to it. Look beyond user stories. The thing is that user stories in the project and IT world became quite of a catchy word. Everyone heard about user stories, everyone likes to do user stories, and everyone wants to do user stories. And that's kind of a trap, because requirements are not only about the user stories. Requirements may be in different form, provided in different form. It may be processes, it may be some kind of mock-ups, it may be some kind of videos even. Uh, actually, I've encountered a project where elements of the backlog were actually videos from the product owner explaining some kind of scenarios for the user. And these were the elements of the backlog, rather than documents in a strict form. So try to look beyond user stories. User stories are not always the right way to solve the backlog. Third to say no. It's all about managing expectations because you want to have good relationship with your customer. But also it's quite important to clarify to the customer that not all of the things that he wants to put into the project are actually right for the project. So the really important thing is for you as a business analyst to learn to say no to the customer and to know when to say no. Because then you'll have a clean backlog without any disruptions. So, if we manage to use all of those practices, or even a part of those, the expectation is that from the plan, we'll go to shiny new stone castle. But, there are also some traps that you need to avoid. So first of all, business value. We tend to focus uh, a bit too much about business value. In all of the books, in all of the theory that you can find about backup management, about the agile approach to the products, they're always focusing about business value. I don't think that's the right approach. Some of the elements may have business value. It's quite easy to define business value for some of the elements, but it may be really hard to do it for the other ones. For example, the one that are dependent on each other. So that's why business value it's not always the right thing to do. You do not need to define business value for each and every element of the project as a user. So we are going back to user stories with this one. Uh, as user stories are as popular as I described, uh, there tends to be a thing related to it that whenever I see user stories, there is as a user or as a system. What kind of user stories? Try to always think about the persona that you are doing the user story for. If you are using this exact format, you can use PDD, you can use uh, this, this kind of description, but always try to identify the personas that are inside the project. And do not, I repeat, do not uh, put any technical task as user stories, because that's not the whole point of the user stories. Go. We tend to forget about the goal that we have for building the backlog. You need to remember that by forming your vision, you're actually influencing the goals that you will have in the way in the project. So for each and every sprint that you have, try to form a goal. Try to put some of the features together to form a goal for a sprint. Then you'll have a line backlog and you'll have a clear vision for a future of what's needed to be done. 
sharing this character. Once again, we are going back to exposing the backlog for all of the people involved. If you're a customer, you want to see a backlog. If you're a team member, you want to see a backlog. If you're a manager, you want to see a backlog. So try to share your backlog as much as possible to gather the feedback. It may work in a way that, for example, you use a detailed backlog for your team with all of the additional descriptions and things that need to be done. And you're exposing some kind of a high-level backlog, high-level description to the customer. It doesn't matter. It's just all about monitoring the progress and the things that need to be done within the whole solution, within the whole uh, goal that we have set for the whole project. And prioritize. I cannot stress this enough. You have to have your priorities straight in the background. If you do not have priorities, then it's really hard to manage what's needed to be done. How to prioritize? You can prioritize individually if you have uh, enough knowledge about the way that the customer wants to go, or you can prioritize with the customer. On the workshop, invite a customer to the growing meeting, but get those priorities straight. And then that brings us actually to the end. If you want to know more things about how to manage your product, here are some QR codes. The first one is for the other product management with Scrum by Roman Peter. That's a really good book with a set of good and best practices about the product management, many techniques, many uh, um, skills that you may improve with this book. And the second one is the introduction of the impact maps. Why impact maps? Because I think that this is the, one of the most in interesting approach to the product management. And also the thing that, that not a lot of people know about. And it's really useful for, them, for your company and for the project. Are there any questions, Karen? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, well, I'd like to go back and start to show three backlogs. I just want to specify this. Me, personally, I have two backlogs, and I think that it's quite hard to manage them. And you mentioned three. Yeah. Can you just put some words on how to practically work with this? Okay, so uh, these two backlogs at the very beginning are only used at the very beginning of a project. So it's always a good situation when you are working on a project that is just about to start, because then you can form some kind of an opportunity backlog. So think of the of first backlog as something that you bring, for example, from the discovery, something that you bring from pre-sales process. And then you transform it to the filter backlog, which describes the scope in general. If you compare it to, for example, to the waterfall project, uh, filter backlog may be some kind of RFI. RFI that you provide to the customer. So what you will actually do for a project. And the only thing that you need to care of during the whole project is the team backlog. So those two backlogs at the very beginning are only used for starting of a project and for historical purposes only in the future. Because sometimes you need to go back to some things to see what was the purpose at the very beginning, what was the elements at the very beginning, or perhaps we, we've thrown away some of the elements at the very beginning. But those two backlog at the very beginnings are all are only used at the very beginning of a project. Then you are only using the team backlogs. Uh, but what about uh, customers' feedback? I mean, we still keep getting the feedback from marketing, from sales, and uh, well, me personally, I keep this opportunity to filter in backlogs to manage the requests, for particular features, or you know, new stuff we have to do, and they don't get to team backlog directly because that's going to be in us. Um, so I wonder, maybe we are doing this in the wrong way, I mean, how do we track this constantly incoming requests? I mean, our, our project lasts for three years already, and mm -hmm. we are just in the very beginning. I know that it's going to be like several years further. Um, so we will definitely keep getting the incoming requests. So what yeah. do you suggest? So there are a couple of approaches that you can have. Uh, first of all, you can use the problem mode that, uh, that I've talked about. Uh, a bit earlier, and uh, use a pro pro problem board as some kind of an entry point for a backlog. Because uh, as a backlog goes, you have some kind of main goal set for the project that you have. And you always need to uh, analyze if the task, if the requirement the customer is supporting is the one that needs to go to the backlog, and then confront the customer whether we want to go in this direction because you have to have an estimated and so on, 
or are willing to throw something out from the back. Because Maclog, uh, even though it's roamed and refined, it, the team backlog is some kind of closed entity. It is evolving, but it's quite closed when it comes to uh, high scope that you define at the very beginning. Thank you very much.